Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And today, we're so fortunate to be joined by the fantastic Ken Mock, who has had an amazing array in his career from creating and producing reality shows such as America's Next Top Model and Making the Band, producing films like Invincible and Joy, and currently is writing and directing his own film, which is coming out called The Right One. And I actually wanted to start by talking about the screenwriting process, because mm -hmm. you've been writing for you know, nearly two decades and putting together screenplays. And then you mentioned that about four or five years ago, you started to kind of feel more confident in your writing and wanting to yeah. put it out there a little bit more, but also felt that you needed to improve your writing a little bit as well. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask about how did you set about trying to improve your, your work as a writer and, and what were some of the things that you did as part of that process? Yeah, I think you know the best way for you to become a good writer or a writer mm -hmm. is by writing that there's really no substitute for it. And so, you know, when I started my career many years ago, I always wanted to write. I always wanted to write and direct. And I also really wanted to be able to, at that time I was a creative exec overseeing, you know, comedies and dramas. And so in order to really kind of have productive conversations with the writers, you really had to speak their language. So what I did was I just started writing on my own, right? So that I understood the craft. And, you know, as I, as you said, you know, and as, as I've said, you know, it took me a really long time to become a really good writer. I think for a very long period of time, for a good 10, 15 years, as I was writing spec screenplays or spec scripts, you know, I was very brutal. I was brutally honest with myself. I mean, my, my, my script writing was pretty solid. I thought I was like a B or a B plus. But I knew at that point that I really couldn't go out with those scripts or try to get those scripts made because if you're a B or a B plus writer, you're out there with a ton of other B or B plus writers. Mm -hmm. um, so you just get swallowed up in the crowd. And who wants to make a B or a B plus movie or a B plus script? You really want to have a script that really stands out. So I just kept at it. I just kept at it. And then when I realized in this last five years or six years or so, when I was really getting tired of you know, producing in the un unscripted genre. Mm -hmm. Not because I, I, I don't like unscripted, but it's like when you do it for a long time, you just mm -hmm. kind of, you want to keep yourself creatively challenged. Mm -hmm. So I really spent the last five years really focused on my writing and the craft of writing. And then somehow like a few years ago, I really just kind of made a breakthrough with it. I just realized, oh, my writing has gone from here to here. And that's when I really had the confidence to now get my, uh, my uh, scripts out to producers, et cetera, et cetera, to see if they could get behind a script and make a feature. And then I got very lucky that there's a number of scripts that people had responded to. And then I got very fortunate that the right one was the, the first script to get made into a film. It was no pun intended, the right one. <laughs> You're right, exactly. <laughs> And then I wanted to talk about the central character that you have in this film with Godfrey, because um, I heard that you based him a little bit on the idea of, of Peter Sellers, who, you know, was a phenomenal actor, yeah. but famously had no sense of who he was when he wasn't in character. And that yeah. that was part of the jumping off point for this central character in your film, who kind of puts on a lot of, lot of different personas for himself. And we learned that he's been doing that for several years. So what was that journey of, of diving into the world of Peter Sellers, but then discovering it even further than that and figuring out the way that you wanted to bring this out in your central character. Yeah, so um, you're exactly right. I mean, the, the idea for the story came from, from kind of two things. One was, yes, my fascination with pre Peter Sellers. And for, for the viewers that don't know who Peter Sellers is, you know, he's most famously known for, you know, playing the Pink Panther in the Pink Panther series. Um, and he's a British actor. He was a British actor, brilliant mimic. He could do Cockney accents. He could do Indian accents. He could do American Southern accents. And when he played these characters, he fully inhabited them that you couldn't tell the difference between who he was and who the character was. It was seamless. But by all accounts, in real life, he didn't know who he was. Uh, and a lot of people said he was really mentally unstable because he was literally like this cipher, like this empty vessel, and he only came alive uh, when he was playing a character. And that really made me start thinking about a person like that, what would cause a person to have such a weak sense of self or, you know, or be a person who only wants to come alive when he plays a character? Uh, and then like a few years ago, I was reading this article in the New York Times about this woman who was like a huge uh, social influencer. She was like a girl in her 20s. She had a huge following. And all of a sudden she quit. And the reason why she said she quit was because everything she was posting was fake. Right. It was like this completely 
like idealized, curated, idealized version of herself. And she couldn't deal with that anymore and she left. And it really started making me think about identity in, in the culture now and how in a lot of ways, social media really has produced a culture of inauthenticity, right? So we're all putting ourselves out there in a kind of idealized way. It's not the real version of ourselves. My daughter, who's 19, like so many you know, people of a younger generation, they have their Instagram account and they have their Finsta account, right? So one's for public consumption and one reflects the real version of themselves. And so when I took that idea and I took that idea and combined it with this whole thing with Peter Sellers, that's how this script came together. Yeah. And then I thought it was so interesting in terms of Godfrey's relationship with Sarah in the film is that you've created this central relationship that kind of comes together with these two people getting to know each other. But it's, you know, and it's got slight elements of like romantic comedies in, in a slightly more dramatic way. But it's never about whether they sleep together or whether they end up together romantically. It really right. is just these two people who, you know, have had uncertainties in their life and, and trying to find an emotional connection. So what was the way in which it was really important for you to approach those characters with that particular mindset? Yeah, you know, this really to me was a kind of a different take on the romantic comedy. Um, you know, I, I thought it was, in fact, the interesting thing um, was that this film wasn't really um, imagined in the beginning as a romantic comedy. It was really kind of, I thought of a drama with some comedic elements. But the interesting thing is, as I was shooting the film, the tone of it changed because the woman who played Sarah, um, is such a terrific actress, Cleopatra Coleman. There's a scene in the film um, where she sees her ex-boyfriend in the park and then meets the boyfriend's husband. And I originally wrote that pretty straight, but I allowed her to do some ad-libbing in that scene. And she was so funny. I mean, she was so funny in that scene that after we shot the takes, I said to Cleo, I said, it's so interesting because I just saw what you're doing in this film and you're really changing the tone of the film. Like you were supposed to be the straight person in the film, but you're really turning into comedic actress. So I started completely rewriting her character in the, in the script to really take advantage of her comedic chops. So it actually ended up turning into kind of this romantic comedy. But in terms of the relationship between her and Godfrey, I always envisioned it as a friendship because these are two damaged people who were like healing each other. But Godfrey is kind of profoundly damaged. And to me, it would have felt odd for him to develop a romantic relationship or to sleep with him because he's so, he's not, he's not whole yet, right? So it didn't really make sense. So I really made it about a friendship between these two people. And that seems to be something that a lot of people seem to be responding to, that um, they liked that they didn't sleep together. They liked that they were friends and were there for each other uh, to kind of, you know, make both of themselves whole. Yeah, that's so fascinating the way that she kind of very much shifted the tone of, of what the film was and what that character was. And, and I know that in directing it as well, when you were shooting a lot of the scenes that you would, you know, kind of put together your plan and then give the actors a little bit of freedom to play around on, on one or yeah. two of the takes as well. What were some of the moments that you feel really came into the film just from those scenes where you gave them the opportunity to try something completely different to what was on the page? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I got very lucky with this cast not only with the principal cast, but the supporting cast, uh, which were all these Canadian actors, because I shot this up in Vancouver. The principal cast, like when you had Nick and you had uh, you know, Eliza Schlesinger, who are comedians. So they're kind of used to improv and, and, and being funny. Um, and, and then again, luckily Cleo was so gifted at comedy. So you know, giving them the freedom to, to, to kind of improv really came up, we came up with some great stuff. So like there's a scene at the end of the movie where they're in the, the literary agent's office and half of that scene was improv. The scene between Eliza and the literary agent who's this really, really funny woman named Amy Goodmurphy. And they just started riffing off of each other. And um, I really had a hard time like keeping quiet during those takes because the stuff they were coming up with was fantastic. The stuff with uh, Godfrey when he's performing at the club um, or DJing or, you know, at the office when he's talking to, to, uh, to customers, that was all that lived. I just said, Nick, do your thing. I'll just keep on shooting and then I'll take the best bits. And that's exactly what happened. And then when you have a person like David Koechner who played, uh, you know, Nick's boss in the, in the movie, again, really gifted uh, comedic actor, great at improv. So again, got very lucky in the movie with them. 
Yeah. And you were just mentioning Eliza Schlesinger, who you actually had in mind when you were writing the script even. Yeah. So how did that inform the way that you were writing a lot of the comedic beats for that particular character, just knowing her as a performer at that point? Well, there were actually two influences for um, the, the role of Kelly, Eliza's character. One was my good friend, Kelly Catrone. So Ke if you don't know who Kelly is, Kelly is this very famous PR agent in the fashion world. On MTV, she had her own uh, TV series uh, for a couple of seasons. And Kelly, you know, and, and Kelly Catrone is just this, I love her to death. She wears her heart on her sleeve. She's brash. She has no filter. She's just stream of consciousness. So that character came along very easily. And then as I was watching Eliza, um, in her stand-up, because my wife is a huge fan of Eliza's, and you watch her Netflix specials, I'm like, that is Kelly. Like, the brashness that Eliza has um, was exactly perfect for it. So I wrote it for her, and I called her immediately, and I said, please do this role, because I had a picture of you on my my board in front of a computer as I was writing this. And I got to tell you, she's phenomenal. Like, you know, you see her in this film, she's t incredibly funny. She can do dramatic stuff. She can do comedy. She's a complete pro. I do think she's going to be a breakout character in this movie. And I keep on telling Eliza, I think she's going to have a really huge career. And I really think she will. I mean, I love Eliza. I also thought it was so interesting that with Eliza's character that you take those very early scenes and we we really at the beginning just see the very brash side of her you know we see her screaming and enjoying screaming at someone in a grocery store but then you really flip it on its head later on in the film like when she suddenly is talking about you know Buddhist interpretations of of Sarah's actions and the consequences yeah. on people around her which is a really unexpected character shift so how did you want to really use those scenes later to develop this other side of her and to really uncover different different parts of who she is uh, yeah again great observation to get there too because I love it when characters have twists to them that you get to pull the rug out in terms of your expectations of that and by the way that was reflected in real life Kelly Catrone is a Buddhist which just made me laugh out loud because like Kelly Gatron is the worst Buddhist ever. She's screaming at her assistants all the time. She's throwing things, she's crazy. I'm like, she's like the opposite of what a Buddhist is, but she's a Buddhist. And then when you really talk to Kelly, you know, in moments of quiet, you realize, or and you just realize Kelly has the greatest open heart towards other people. She's so empathetic to people. She cares about people. And that's what I loved about this character, you know, with, with Kelly, so that the audience would think she's going this one way. And then all of a sudden in the end, oh my God, she's this Buddhist. And she's the one that really, she's the moral center of the film. She gets Sarah to go back on the right path. You realize that, oh, Sarah, you think Sarah's this great person, but you realize at the end, you know, that she's been very selfish and she's lived this very selfish life. And then Kelly's really the one that helps her get back on the path. So I just love these twists with the characters. It's unexpected and it just, it, it just makes for a better story. Yeah. And in terms of the character Godfrey, we see all these different iterations of who he's trying to be throughout the film. You know, you have him busking outside on the streets and singing yeah. and putting on an accent as like a cowboy character. We see him, you know, volunteering and working at a school with a group of kids. We see him DJing on stage with kind of a dead mouse yeah. inspired costume. How did you decide what you wanted to say about him through these different journeys and these different careers and, and moments that he creates for himself? Well, I think, you know, when you look at the psycho psychology of the character, what, how I created this character was what, what made Godfrey who he is. And it really had to do with this tragedy that's at the, at the center of the film. And that his way of dealing with that tragedy was by not being himself going away from himself, not dealing with the reality of that situation and escaping into other characters. The fascinating thing about this movie is that <laughs> I had originally written this script for somebody else. I, there was a very specific actor that I wanted to do this. I wrote the script, I sent it to that actor, the actor loved the script and said, I'm gonna do it. I was thrilled. And then what happened, I, was, I went up to Vancouver and I was prepping the film and six weeks before I'm gonna start shooting, all of a sudden he drops out. And I was like, oh my God. And he dropped out and because he dropped out, my lead actress dropped out because they had a relationship, they knew each other. So all of a sudden I had no film. I had, I had everybody else in the cast, but I didn't have my, my lead actor. 
And then it's like five weeks left. And I knew Nick and I knew uh, Cleo. So I was, we were going after them, but while we were trying to negotiate with them, it's like five weeks, four weeks, three weeks. I didn't get Nick until two weeks before we start principal photography. I mean, it was like the most stressful thing. So what happened was Nick, because I wrote it for this other actor who had these, uh, this other skill set. the second I brought Nick up, I said, Nick, you got to come up right away. So I get to know what you can do. And so Nick came up, we went through the script. We kind of, I got to know Nick and what he could do. I knew he was a musician. He could play the guitar. He could do this, he could do that. So what I had to do right away is I had to rewrite that character and the characters that he was playing in the script to fit his skill set. And so you'll see in the film that the two musical performances that Nick does in that film are, are uh, songs that he wrote himself and that, uh, that he performs. Uh, and there's actually, and Cleo turned out to be an amazing singer as well, by the way. The song at the end of the movie that's in the montage, she, she sang that song. And she's an amazing singer too. I think she just released a, a, an album. And given that you went through that journey with losing those original cast members and, and having to recast with Nick and Cleopatra, how did that really shift and alter the way in which you had to suddenly work with them to, to go through everything that you imagined for these characters, work with them on bringing in their vision and kind of collaborating on, on who these were going to end up being on screen very differently to the way that you'd originally envisioned that you were going to get to do a lot of that work and a lot of that process because you were already in the mix and having those types of conversations with the original cast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, that's the great thing. I've actually like, I came from the unscripted world. So I did a lot of unscripted series beforehand. And I think what really helped me in this situation is when you work in the unscripted world, it's, there's really no difference between that world and the scripted world, right? It's like, you know, and I, I said this in another interview, like, there's a huge overlap, because even in a scripted world, you have to have characters you like, uh, you have to tell a story for them. There has to be a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the story arc has to be the same. But the thing is, in the scripted world, there's so many um, factors that you don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes things completely go south because you're shooting reality. And you really got to think quickly on your feet to you know, redo something or redo this or redo that. So you're used to uncertainty. So in a weird way, on this film, when those two actors dropped out, and I had to really think quickly on my feet and scramble. I was used to that process. So I was able to get through it. And then once Nick and Cleo came on, I was able to quickly readapt with them. So like I said, with Nick, I rewrote the, the script and the character to fit his skill set. And then with Cleo, like I said, it really was a pig in the poke with Cleo because I hadn't worked with her. I knew how talented she was. But like I said, that day on that set where she she uh, she shot that park scene with her ex Simon and Allegra, it just was a revelation to me because I just did not know that Cleo was so gifted comedically, and I just I remember this that day just like it was yesterday. I just stopped her there and I just said, "You're amazing," and now I'm going to rewrite the script for you because you just have these comedic chops, and I think people are really going to be surprised by Cleo in this film because they're so used to her seeing kind of like in more dramatic stuff and more straight fare, but she's so funny in this film. So you get really interesting surprises and, you know, the key is to be able to roll with those surprises and utilize them uh, to best of your ability, which I did with both of them. Were there ways in which when you were directing scenes with them all that you were making different sorts of adjustments in, in how you would work with each of them individually on scenes and, and the conversations that you would have and the way that you would communicate with them yeah. based off like reading how they worked as performers and what e they each uniquely needed from you as a director? Yeah, I mean, look, every, every actor is completely different from one another, you know, and they all have their needs. Uh, and they all have their, their process of working. You know, Nick, you know, like Nick was a guy that like you, you found, I found it very quickly, like he needs to really warm up, right? So, you know, in the first few takes, he's trying to find his way there. And then by the end of the takes, like he's great. So, you know that, so you know how you really want to shoot to make sure that by the time you get to those takes, you're going to get your best stuff. So you might shoot your master first, right? Get it out of the way. Let him kind of ramp up. You know, with Cleo, it was different. Cleo was like, she was hot right out of the gate. 
And so you could shoot in any order with her as, as, as you wanted. Eliza was the same thing. Eliza, like, I got to tell you, I think Eliza, in the whole time I shot with her, never messed up one take, ever. Like, boom. Like, if I said, Eliza, you got one take to do this, she would do it. Like, she was so prepared. Like, all the actors really brought a great skill set to it. And by the way, there were times, because this was really kind of an indie film, you're really pushed on time, right? You, you, you know, you're not shooting like a, a major feature film where you're shooting 35 or 38 days or 40 days. In this film, I had 23 days to shoot it and it was all practical location. So there were no sets. So half your shooting day is gone because you're doing company moves. So there's amazing pressure on you to get, you know, the shots out. So there will be times like at two in the morning, I'd have 15 minutes left and I'd have like four setups left. And so I'd have to say to like, Nick or Eliza or Cleo, we got to do one take in a safety and they, and we would rehearse off to the side while they're setting up the camera. And I pretend it was like a take and then the camera go on and they, they shoot their scenes and they get it and they nail the performance. So, like I said, I'm so fortunate with this cast that they could deliver on what, what they could do. I also imagine that having produced, you know, Invincible and Joy and, and been a producer for other filmmakers, yeah. that there's a huge benefit to that from what you get to learn in the process. But also when you're producing someone else's film, you're really supporting their vision and, and really finding the different ways that they can be there for you. And as a producer, what are the ways that you felt like you were really able to best support director's vision? And in turn, how did that influence the way that you looked for producers to bring onto this project to support you in that same way? Yeah, I, you know, look, my whole career as a producer, I have been used to being in complete creative control, right? So when I, the, when I was doing unscripted shows, I was the executive producer of the shows. And in that, in that type of show, you have more creative control than you would in a scripted drama, right? So in a scripted drama, like a television series, you know, if you are the EP, like you run the writer's room, you know, you're writing the scripts, the director's doing their thing, the product, you know, but in the unscripted world, you really have to be like a jack of all trades. So you would be in charge of the writing, the producing, the production design, the costuming, you know, the locations, you would be directing, you know, the pieces. And I loved it because it allowed me to control the whole production. It allowed me to have complete creative control over, uh, over the show. And that's very much the same thing in the, as a director, right? Because directing a feature is for most people, like if you're like a young kid, you're 23 or 24 and you're coming in for the first time directing, it's daunting because you're doing all of it. It's not just directing the actors, it's overseeing the whole production. So when I was producing film, it wasn't really satisfying for me, right? Because I'm used to having complete control over the, the, the project. And basically what happens with the film director is they're, they're the equivalent of what I am in TV. And so although I'm really proud of both those films, those films are great. And David O. Russell did a great job on that film, uh, Joy, and had a great cast. And Mark Wahlberg was great and invincible. It wasn't creative satisfying to me. And really, after doing Joy, I realized that if I really want to have creative control over my feature career, which is what I really only want to focus on now, I would have to have creative control. The only way I can have creative control is not only if I wrote the script, because what happens in screenwriting is the writer writes the script and then it gets turned over to the director and they get cast aside. You know that. I would have to direct it as well. So I wrote my scripts and I said, I'm not going to allow this to be made unless I direct it. And so I really, really pushed hard on this film, the right one. And fortunately, because the budget was lower and it was an indie film, uh, and because I think I had a lot of experience already, like I wasn't like, I'm not like a 23 year old kid. I'm, I'm a guy that's been in the business a long time. I was able to make that happen. And um, I just really am very thankful that that, that happens. And so uh, it's been, it's been great. And even to your point about the amount of yeah. experience that you came into this project with, it was still your first time writing and directing a narrative feature film. So what yeah. did you find were the most unexpected learning curves where maybe you hadn't even anticipated that that would be something that was just completely a new realm for you? Um, well, I think the great thing about approaching this film as a director that really helped me for the first time as director is that I wrote the, the script. Right. So when you write the script, when, when I was writing the script, as most screenwriters will tell you, they already picture the picture in their head. So I knew exactly how the film should look. And then from 
writing it, I storyboarded the whole film myself. I did every single shot. I had like a 250 page storyboard. And so I knew the script inside and out. I knew exactly how it should be shot. I think the thing that really, well, that I really learned the most of is was working with the DPs in terms of um, a lot of tricks that you could use in the film to make the film work in terms of the way you shoot setups and the type of lenses you're using. Because what basically would happen is I would tell them exactly how I want the shot to work and how I want it to be blocked. And then they would come in and say, we could do it this way, we could do it this way, we could do it this way. And it was so interesting to learn some of those aspects of filmmaking uh, that I wasn't really aware of. So it, that was a great learning experience for me. And I also realized that the interesting thing is as a director, you know, there are some directors who know everything technical about the camera. Like, so like Stanley Kubrick was not only a great director, he knew the lenses and how it worked inside the camera, and blah, 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 blah. But you don't really have to be that person. You can be a director who knows nothing about how a camera works. Like for me, like inside the camera, it might be a gerbil and a hamster wheel turning the motor. I, I have no idea. But as a storyteller, the most important thing is directors, you need to know how to tell your story and how you want the shot to look, right? To tell that story, to make sure you're servicing the emotion of the scene. Then you can rely on your DPs. That was the greatest thing I learned that I did not need to know the technical stuff. I just needed to translate what I wanted to the DOP and they can make that happen. Yeah. Well, congratulations on everything that you've achieved in, in making this film. And thank you so much for taking time to talk with us this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.